So, welcome to this live stream on, uh, well, I'm calling this the surefire way to get your child riding. The surefire way. Um, so, before I tell you the surefire way, or maybe even why you should listen to me, let me just tell you my story, if that's okay. So, I grew up in a, in a family that was actually... Uh, had writers in it. Dad was a writer, pretty good writer and editor of college paper and stuff like that. Went into law, didn't write. Uh, but his brother, my uncle did and uh, had wrote all kinds of things. He was a speech writer for Werner von Braun, the uh, uh, rocket scientist. Uh, he was in the Air Force uh, for a time as part of that. Uh, novelist. He died really young, so he never blossomed. He did work with a lot of Southern writers and uh, Southern projects back there in Alabama. But, but then my brother was a good writer. He was four years older and he was on the school newspaper and had opinion pieces and stuff like that. And so I'm surrounded by these people who can write. And I found just terrific joy in writing. I just love to write. And, and even though in our system, you're constantly criticized for it. So one of the first poems I wrote, lengthy poems, ish was uh, in like eighth grade one Saturday evening and my brother came home from a date or something. I showed it to him and he accused me of lying that I had not written it. Well, in a way that's a backhanded compliment, you know, like this is too good for you. Uh, but there's that. So, so I go on and I start working at writing and reading some stuff a little bit in high school. And, um, uh, I, I, I get to this thing called the ACT, like the SAT, the ACT college entrance test. And I literally flunked, flunked the English portion of the test. Uh, I made a terrible, terrible score. My overall score was fine. Got in college and all everything else brought it up. And, and part of that so bothered me that I decided to go into English literature as my major, I wound up minoring in fiction writing and then, um, uh, communications, fiction writing may have been one course short from a double minor. I can't remember, but uh, basically communications and writing. And then I taught communications there at the University of Alabama. But in studying literature, I was trying to figure out how grammar and writing and all this stuff works. So I took uh, writing courses, uh, some pretty well-known uh, writers that were mentors of mine. And I never could make sense of it, especially grammar. I tried to find a grammar course. I could not find their only grammar course on the entire campus was for engineers like technical writing or something for them. Nobody taught grammar and I understand why now, but it took me some years to figure this game out. Just sitting there wrestling with, um, with this whole issue of writing and what I, in the course of time, in all my struggle and difficulty, I mean, my, my first book I wrote was actually a series of messages I'd given that were converted into text that I edited, that somebody initiated that process for me. And it scared me to death. I mean, it literally scared me to death. And until I figured out uh, anything worth saying is worth saying poorly, you know, <laughs> and books are never completed, they're just abandoned. Uh, I started getting better. So I've written, you know, eight or nine books and have one that I'm about to finish uh, on homeschooling. And um, as I, as I wrestled with this, this is where the writing course came from. And the writing course came about by me wrestling and rethinking the whole nature of what was really going, going on with writing as I continued to study the, the uh, creative process. And so what, what I discovered out of my pain and difficulty and frustration was a way to know my grammar was great without knowing the rules, how to punctuate properly without knowing what the rules of punctuation are. I've got a book over, uh, it's over upstairs now, but it's on the 31 uses of the comma, like Barnes and Noble book that they put out. And it's just awful. <laughs> it's just really, I've got to remember 31 ways for the comma. Let me tell you, you're fixing to make your life so much better because your kid can learn to write. Your child can, and he or she can learn how to do grammar and punctuation without knowing rules, which is kind of crazy because there's always an instinct. I believe a uh, uh, hard drive chip in there, I guess you'd say rather uh, that 
they know how to do language if you just teach them the code, kind of like reading. If they just know the phonetics, the code, they can decipher it. Well, you know, what the writing course is, is the code. But what I want to do, I'm not trying to uh, get you to get the writing course. Uh, a lot of you already have it, but I'm, I'm actually just wanting to do a quick summary of this issue of the surefire way to get your kid writing. Now, what I'm going to do is just go through the five W's and an H. OK, so who, what, when, where, why and how. And I think as I unravel those, you're going to get a lot of practical stuff. And when I get to the how, obviously, uh, it'll be uh, it'll be practical for you. So so who is to do the writing now? I, I would think that you should know that it's obvious the child is to do the writing. But you know what? It is not uncommon for parents not to let the kid write. Not only not give them permission, but to write instead, write for them, correct for them, and to constantly do it in such a way that the child can't learn. You know, if you do things for people that they can learn to do themselves, if you do it for them, you'll kind of cripple them. You'll hinder them. You'll hobble them. So the, the who in the writing is the child, and it's going to be the child's voice, and it's going to be the child's story, and it's going to be the child's stuff that the the child is learning and does it grow up to towards teen and adulthood it's still their thing you can make suggestions you can suggest what might sound a little better but it is they who are writing it's not about you and if your child turns out to be a great writer or a poor writer it still doesn't say anything about you it's just you're there to encourage them to learn that's all it is. And some, I think everybody can learn to write. I think this is one of the myths, just like everybody can learn to run. Uh, some run really well. Some run okay. But we can all run. We can all write, too. It's just most people aren't taught how. So that's the who. You know, what? What is this process of writing? So so here's what writing is. It's, it's kind of interesting. Um, we speak language. So it's these sounds that put together abstractions and a grammar that conveys information like I'm doing here. That's what the language game is. Writing is, is one step down where we have a written code um, that we can use. And what writing does is allows us to play with it and tweak it to get it just right. We can't do that much in our head to get it just right. We're much more spontaneous, interactive, stream of consciousness, we have intention and we say stuff, but writing allows us to say things in a much more targeted uh, kind of way. But all writing really is, at least at the start, it's, it's putting down in these symbols, letters and words and all, it's putting it down on paper how you would have, if you gave it to them, someone else read it out loud. That's actually what writing is. It's writing in such a way that a person who reads it aloud will be saying in the same sound and sequence and emphasis uh, pauses as you wanted them to. That's what it is. It's this written code. So someone else can essentially read it out loud or understand your thoughts, right? That's what it is. And when you start thinking about writing by sound, the whole game will change. It becomes glorious. In fact, you're writing. If you learn to write the way we recommend your writing will be far more poetic. You won't be good at technical writing, but that puts everybody into a comb anyway. So it has more poetry to it, has more language, flair, flavor uh, to it. And, and obviously, it's going to be able to find your voice, uh, technical writing, et cetera, trying to get the voice to go away. So you just sound like everyone else. Not for that. Not a fan. So we got who and what. Uh, when? When should your child be writing? Well, in my personal conviction, uh, they should be writing. Let's try this during school, right? During homeschooling. Uh, they can certainly write afterwards, too, but it needs to be a part of the. Uh, 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 it needs to be a part, as it were. It needs to be when, when you think this thing through. Uh, about uh, when they're writing, it's in homeschool, but it needs to be daily. Now, now this will freak some of you out, and you just need to unfreakify yourself because, look, this daily practice, just some daily, builds the skill. 
because writing is a skill game and you cannot build a skill sporadically. Try doing math once a week. Uh, try reading even once a week. Reading's a little different once you get it down, but that's a skill. I'm telling you that if you want your kid to learn to be confident and write and enjoy it plenty, uh, it's going to be a day in, day out thing. Now, take the weekends off, whatever, but during school daily. So there's the who, what, when, where do they write? Uh, this is kind of important. I would encourage you to figure that out and make sure they're writing in the same place. They want the flexibility, but there's for writing, there's something about our environment that affects us. So I would say if you figure it out with them, maybe it's just their desk in school, and that's fine. But it needs to be consistently that place, at least while they're learning. So their writing time is a writing event. I, I think it could be decent if you move them to a table to look out a window or something like that, because there are things out there that can spark thoughts. Some of the exercises we like to get people to do is to write uh, a description of what they see outside. So they're just learning in that process. So um, who, what, when, where, and now why? Uh, probably the question I should start with, but they don't flow out that way. Uh, so why do you want your kid to learn to write? Why do you want your child to be decent at writing? And I'm going to tell you, it's this simple. If they can learn to write, they will have access to the highest positions uh, of employment in our nation for a long time. And, and the reason is not just that they need to know how to write, but that writing is sort of at the apex. It's at the top of our learning process. So if you think in a classical model, we have data down here. So we just memorize facts and details and information. Then logic is the next stage. And so logic is where we put the patterns together. So we make sense of all the data points so we can weave the pieces together. So like in reading, you could see, you know, there's a witch and a goblin and a knight and a dragon and a prince and a whatever. And all these pieces come together into a storyline, a pattern. There's a logic to it. So that's the logic level. Any subjects are this way. We learn vocabulary uh, in a foreign language, and then we learn the grammar, how it works together. So that's the logic stage. And then the highest stage is the rhetoric stage. And what they mean, the terms fall into hard terms, but what rhetoric means really is communication or effective communication. I think Aristotle pointed out that the truth is great rhetoric, which I'm a fan of. Um, so rhetoric is a using information that the data stuff and the logic stuff and using with other human beings. And so when you, when you can get to where you can master being able to put on paper your thoughts and words, you're, you're actually generating clearer thinking. So it actually, it's a strange thing, but when you think clearly, you tend to be able to write better. And then when you write, you tend to think better. So learning to use, like most geniuses, uh, studies have demonstrated this, the difference with geniuses since the 1600s, some study I looked at, uh, these geniuses all had notebooks and they wrote stuff and diagrams and wrote things to them, spelled it, that 95% of them did. 95% of us don't. So um, I'm getting some great questions and I'll get to them in just a second uh, because they're, they're really super. Um, here, here, here's the trick. Um, when you understand that this writing thing is part of what coordinates the brain and puts it together and then allows them to do things with it that work 24 seven. Cool thing about writing a book is it can work 24 seven. You don't have to be there. Works all the time. Uh, notes, you leave a note. If you go out of town, you leave notes to the kids of where the food is and what to do. It's magic because then they have the information. Now we can call on cell phones and such, but you get the point. So, so bear in mind that this writing thing is something that really makes the brain work in a profound way. Uh, so the how. So let me mention the how. Um, the how, several things here. So I mentioned daily. So you want your child to write some daily. How much you get to figure out. We um, with the, when the kids were younger up to about 12, I'd say it was, um, maybe a page, every other line, 
uh, it may have not been that late. It may have been 11 or 10. And then it was two pages. And then the standard was about three pages. Now there were times that we'd do this great experiment and I'd do it with them. We'd sit for two hours straight and just write, or I think it was two, maybe three and just write and write and write and then read our best thing. And it was amazing because when you write that much, you really write yourself into something. Don't try that this week. Uh, just daily, a few words, a few sentences, you know, start where you start. If you have to start with copy work, start there. If you child tells you a story and you write it down, that's fine. You know, before they get good, um, dexterity, um, with their, uh, writing utensil. So, uh, daily. The second thing is for the most part, you want children to write fiction stories they make up or descriptions of things or anything like that. Now, now the reason you write fiction is because fiction, now, now watch this, you're taking notes. It's easier. Did you get that? So it's easier. Why is fiction easier? because you just make it up. That's the way it goes. So if they're sitting there playing with words and sentences and language and images and all, they're teaching their brain about writing and it will translate into essays and it will translate into scientific papers. It will translate into good letters to grandmom. That's the nature of the game. So fiction, she needs to, I mean, she or he needs to, um, be able to make up stories. Uh, the next thing I want to mention to you is you want to stretch the child. You don't torture them. I'm getting some notes here about dyslexia and dysgraphia, and we'll, we'll get to that. Um, but, but, but it's all very similar. So, so if you think about a child learning, it's going to be a stretch game. So, so if you give the child way too much that they can't handle, uh, it'll just stress them out. If you give them way too little, it'll bore them. So you're wanting to figure out where are they? What are they okay with? And begin there. So if they can write a sentence or a description or something like that, that's where you are. Um, if they can only write a few words, uh, then that's where you are. If, if they are um, able to put together a short story, um, then that's where you are. Maybe it's time for them to start working on uh, their great high school novel, right? So, so don't overstretch children. I'd say stretch them rather. Don't torture them. And that's what a lot of this comes down to sometimes. Feedback. They've got to have feedback to improve. And so the way you do feedback, one is you want to stress to your child. I want you to just write something that's okay. I don't want it great yet. I just want it okay. And so okay is the standard. And then you're going to get a I don't have a red one, but you can get a green pen and you're going to get a red pen and you're going to mark what they do as best you can. And it's going to be uh, red means stop. So this is something you need to look at. And green means go. Like, I like this, do more of this. It could be a phrase or sound or way into something or it could be anything. But green tells them go. And people, when you give them feedback that way, you know what I'd like to see even more of? You know what I like that I'd like to see more of? That's feedback that nourishes the soul. We're all busy critiquing, at least in America. So care, you know, understand that aspect and that as you give feedback, you want to give that positive, the green, uh, as much as maybe more than the red. But they need red too. They need to know where the mistakes are. Finally, I'd mention here is uh, focus. So, what you want to do is focus on one issue at a time. Okay. In fact, I'm going to, I just saw this uh, pop in here. So my older child cannot spell. Thanks for sharing it. Um, my older child cannot spell. So this is not as uncommon as you would think. And on, on this issue of focus on one thing at a time, it really gets down to this level. So if a, if a child cannot spell, I'll tell you the secret in just a second. But, but a child that can't spell, what is it they can't spell? And the answer is going to be at least some particular word. So if they uh, constantly misspell a word like, um, I don't know, way, I make up something. It, like something weighs a certain amount, W-E-I-G-H, and they spell it W-A-Y. Well, that's not exactly a spelling. That's a confusion of words. Similar, 
if they just simply misspell things like receive, they don't have the I before E except after C rule in their head. So they misspell the word receive. Practicing that one word until you nail it, until you get that word is actually motion. So sometimes the focus comes down to that. It may not be about spelling. It may be about punctuation. Maybe your child, your child is, is, does not know to capitalize the first word in each new sentence after a period. Well, that might be the only thing to practice. Don't inundate them with a thousand uh, things to fix. Let's just get this one down and then let's do another one. And, and so if you get engaged in that process, it changed everything. Here's, here's the trick to spelling. I mean, there's more to it and how you get feedback, but the basic bottom line with poor spellers is that poor spellers guess and good spellers don't. So I'm a good speller, pretty good speller. I still misspell, but I don't guess at words. So if I don't know the word, I'll find how to spell it or I'll mark it with an SP. So that means go back and figure out how to spell it, Fred. And, or I'll just pick a word I do know how to spell. That may be lazy, but I think that's a mark of a good speller. Poor spellers guess. And if you can start teaching your child to quit guessing, same with phonics and reading. Sometimes they guess words instead of sound it out. Big mistake. Guessing doesn't work with the reading, doesn't work with the writing or the spelling. Don't guess. No. And so from there, if you can start making a little list of like the next five words that are commonly misspelled by your child and nail them down, do you write them over 20 times a day? Maybe, maybe a hundred, maybe you practice them. Maybe you go over it. Maybe it's, I mean, just five misspelled words a week that you really got down in a few weeks, you're starting to build momentum and your child's going to build uh, some confidence. So, those are the basic things. You know, I, uh, I do have some questions here I want to uh, mention. I, I do want to stress that our writing course goes through all this and a whole lot more. Just uh, phenomenal results. Every week we get the sweetest feedback. And, and it's from people with kids with dyslexia and dysgraphia. So I'm going to pop that up there, but I want to show these questions. How do you teach an older child that has dyslexia? that has just started reading. So Jody, uh, my wife, uh, is dyslexic, severe, uh, relatively severely, is pretty tough on her um, growing up. So she went through special training and et cetera. Uh, so um, I, um, it, I have a lot of vested reason in it. And even with my father-in-law, I remember I, I started trying to figure this out when I was first married. He, he said, for example, I can't keep PM and AM straight. And I, was, I taught a memory course, so this was fascinating to me. And I tried to think that through, and I gave him an idea. And this is what dyslexics have to do. They have to think this way. I said, you know, Donald, it seems to me that you know that A comes before P and morning comes before night. So AM is morning, PM is night because A comes before P. And after that, he got it. Now, I'm not saying you're trying to do tricks, but I'm saying this dyslexic mind is just really a different learning processing system. And so you have to learn to play with your own brain of how it works. And so if you can put things in in a way that you can get them back out and understand the game, you're fine. If you compare yourself to other people, that's a problem. Most of us do this. If you can find a memory trick that works for you, use it and don't tell anybody what it is so they won't laugh at you uh, as it were. But um, teaching, uh, you know, older child that has dyslexia has just started reading. There's that relationship. So the more they read and can read, the better off they are. And I would say one of the connections is if they can, you can get them to practice reading out loud. This is very important. Get them to practice reading out loud. So they're hearing uh, the words come through. They're, they're making sense of it. Um, so they're connecting the spoken language with the written language. That's the game. And I'd say it's the same thing with writing. When they write a sentence, if you can get them to stop and read it aloud to make sure it sounds how they want it to, if, you know, the punctuation sounds right, you know, if uh, Jill was excited, uh, but there's not an exclamation mark, you know, you teach them exclamation marks, I mean, 
get excited. Jill was excited, you know, get volume up, either go up or uh, louder. Um, that game is going to be part of the trick to dyslexia. The other thing is their own internal confidence. And I'll have time to explain that now, but the, the nature of perfectionism really melts down uh, dyslexic and dysgraphia and uh, spectrum, et cetera. They just like us, the rest of us that don't quite struggle with those things exactly, still have confidence issues. And we don't have confidence or we got fear, we'll melt down. So part of it is building that confidence, few words at a time, few sentences uh, at a time. Let's see what else we've got here in the way of questions. Someone asks, I'm going to come back to dysgraphia, but someone asked, do you have a suggestion on spelling curriculum? I do. It's the writing course. Um, in the writing course, what we do is we teach you to exactly how to give feedback so it trains your child to become a good speller, no matter who they are. It's totally different than what's out there. It's not uh, some spelling program where you're getting the kids to learn to spell. They're learning to spell in real time. And there's a way we teach you to take the burden off yourself. I mean, off them, put it on you. And so they're free to just focus on writing. And that's part of what frees them up uh, as, it, as it were. So, so here's this question on dysgraphia. And I, I must confess, this is one of the more frustrating learning challenges uh, that, I, that I see. Uh, there are uh, folks in our uh, near family uh, that struggle with this. I've seen others that have struggled with this. And, and it's a little confusing because some of the nature of making marks and all, um, it's still a skill, a developmental thing. So, so Shelly writes, where writing is where my 11 year old daughter struggles the most. She has dysgraphia. I feel just lost as to how to motivate her. Well, yeah, and this is part of the psychology of what's going on inside of her. So she can't feel successful because she's not uh, writing uh, as well. And I don't know what you've worked on. It took me a while to figure out that we should switch from uh, print writing, you know, block writing to cursive. So the cursive motions are easier for people with less dexterity um, to do. What, what I would suggest with your daughter and, and dysgraphia is what Jody likes to do. And that is get her engaged in making up stories or descriptions that you write down. So, so that if you can build for her the, the experience that what she's doing is her stories work enough that she's using language in some cool ways. Again, the green and the red pen, right? Do that and write it for her. And in time, she's going to start seeing that she can do it here. So then the issue is actually just the writing part, not the whole confidence frustration game. And, and again, that's part of the, uh, you know, the magic of, of, of a child learning how to relax about the writing, get off perfectionism. And I would stress, make it okay. You know, that's the, the goal, make it okay, get some help, make it great. You know, if you want it great. So those would be the, uh, the stages, uh, engaged. Um, oh, it's such a great question. I'm not a writer. So how can I teach my kid? Exactly. So quit kid teaching your kid, anything, quit teaching, just stop it. Just, Go back. I have a video from last week or somewhere on YouTube on our uh, independent homeschool uh, videos that says, quit trying to teach them, uh, cause them to learn. You don't have to. Uh, those little kids learn more about computers. Do you know more about computers than your children? Probably not. Or that iPhone and how to run it or whatever, if you have any of those things. Uh, probably not because they're learning machines. That's the game. So how can you teach your child? You don't have to teach your child. The question is, how can you cause your child to learn to write? And the way you can do it is by reading what they've written and giving them some feedback a little bit, what little you know, and then you can start getting your kids give each other feedback. You could enlist others if they want to, if they really want to develop. But the, uh, you know, the fact is you want to cause them to learn. You absolutely do not have to teach your child. You want to cultivate the learning. Do you think all the great writers in history, think about this. Do you think all the great writers in history had parents 
that could write better than them and taught them? No, this is part of this internal talent we have for learning. So what you want to do is cultivate it. And you're going to do that by introducing them to good literature that they read and to getting involved in the writing process, a few words at a time, then a few sentences, then a few paragraphs, you grow their confidence in that way. And that interplay between writing and reading and reading and writing uh, will help their brain begin to make sense of it. We, of course, have courses on most all this stuff, but the best one is this uh, writing course and it's on special sale right now with the events going on. But um, these things that I've told you are kind of plenty. Get them to write every day, give them some feedback, get them to write every day, give them some feedback. So that's got to be enough. Thanks for the interaction. It was uh, super. And uh, we uh, will see you tomorrow at the same time. Thanks.